So Dan Kalish here, and super excited to be talking about organic acids testing and uh, diagnostic solutions. I want to thank them for putting this all together. And thank you guys for showing up and taking some time out of your day. So this is right now at the current point in my life, my most favorite subject to talk about. It's something I've been using in my practice for almost 30 years, and I've finally gotten really good at it. And so I want to share everything that I know with you guys as quickly as possible so that you can get your skill set in lab interpretation up to a level which is truly exciting. Exciting for you, exciting for your patients, and I want you guys to each become your local community's lab interpretation expert, where people hear your name and they think, oh, that's that lab interpretation person who really knows what they're doing in interpreting organic acids. Because very few, very, very few people study this long enough and thoroughly enough to really understand it. And I think uh, there's a couple of reasons why. One is it's a little intimidating because there's a lot of biochemistry and physiology and there's complicated words that are hard to pronounce, like xanthurinate and alpha hydroxybutyrate. Like who can say that stuff, right? So it's complicated. And then the other is that it's not taught very often in a way that's clinically relevant. So everybody thinks that these tests are just for super sick people or just for this or that or just for super advanced clinicians. I run organic acids and amino acids on every new patient. Two-year-old kids, 79-year-old women, 50-year-old athletes, 30-year-old poker players. It doesn't matter if they're sick or healthy, if they live in Malta or they live in Montana. We run organic acids and amino acids on literally every patient. I've been doing that for at least 10 or 15 years. And the results that you get when you, once you learn how to interpret this test are going to be truly outstanding, all right? Because you have to just kind of believe and have a little bit of trust and belief in that. So in June, we're going to offer a long-haul COVID syndrome boot camp. It's a two-month class. You get a discount of 20% if you use this code DS22 for Diagnostic Solutions 22. Uh, and it's going to be a lab interpretation class that's oriented around long haul COVID cases. So this is a big problem. We're seeing it literally every day in the classes that I teach when we get doctors presenting cases. And it's something that the omics test that we're gonna talk about today is perfectly designed to handle. If someone had come up to the scientists that developed this test 10 years ago and said, look guys, I want you to sit down and think really hard about a disease that could happen in the future that's gonna interfere with ACE2 receptors and cause inflammation in all the blood vessels. It's gonna be a virus. We don't know what it's called yet, but I want you to design a test that's gonna be able to help people with that. It would be the test that we're talking about now, okay? And as we go through this, I think you'll understand why, because we're talking about metabolomics and genomics and the intersection between insults that hit the body that interfere with your metabolism and then your genetics and how those things can conspire to make you sick, whether it's a vaccine or it's long haul COVID or it's Lyme disease or it's a yeast overgrowth or it's a heavy metal, whatever it may be, right? That's the trigger. What we're looking at is the assessment for metabolic dysfunction. And that's really what this test is all about. So I run this test on everyone, as I mentioned a minute ago, I run this test every six months on everyone. And I always tell the students in all the classes I teach that you will learn more about your patient on the second omics test than you did on the first. The first one is amazing. The second one, mind-numbingly amazing. And you will see these markers move around. You'll see a lot of information on the second test. So we test people and retest people. That's a basic part of uh, what I do in my practice. And so I um, always want to think about big picture and what are we really looking at uh, from a biochemical kind of physiology standpoint. We're looking at inflammation. We're looking at catabolic physiology. That means of being in a breakdown state where you can look with this test at insulin resistance markers. And of course, oxidative stress is sort of the generator of all bad things in the human body, isn't it? So. There's markers on this test that cover each one of these areas, and these are the four main areas that I try to educate my patients about that these are what we want to look at and turn around and correct, those four areas. And then you can often find out where the damage is coming from. Is it neuroinflammation? Is it gut inflammation? You can find out um, in terms of catabolic physiology, are, in the, are they in a breakdown state because of stress and the stress markers? 
like the catecholamines going off? Or are they in a breakdown state because of toxins and you see the toxic markers are elevated? Is there insulin resistance going on? There's a whole series of markers for that and the early detection of problems related to insulin. And of course, there's a dozen or two markers on this test at least, that are directly relevant to oxidative stress. And then we want to know what's getting damaged. Are your mitochondria getting damaged, your lipids, your DNA? How is that impacting the patient? Okay, and the when, when we do these polls, uh, you know, of like students out there in the universe, um, and we ask like, what do you guys really need? One of the first things, the number one thing that almost always shows up is like, how do I get started? Like, how do I get started with an omics test? Um, because there's such a barrier uh, of, I guess it's fear or lack of understanding or lack of knowledge that we each have in ourselves that uh, how can I do just doing the first one, right? Or doing the, doing the first 10 or 20 of these tests, like how are you gonna get really over that so you can get that confidence that you need to really make this work? And I think one way you can do that is basically by having a simple solution for every major section of the test. So rather than getting complicated and looking at all 12, you know, tryptophan markers, you you look at the group and you say, okay, I'm not going to break this down into each individual marker. I'm just saying, oh, there's a problem there with the brain. So I have a brain supplement over here that I'm going to use. And oh, oh, there's a problem with the mitochondria. I may not know the difference between succinate, dehydrogenase, and what it means when fumarate is high, but I know that there's a mitochondrial product that I can use that's gonna fix this. So if you just have like one or two simple supplements that you use for each section of the test, you're gonna get really great results. And then as the years roll by and you do 10, 20, 50, 100, couple hundred of these, maybe you get up to 500 patients, then you can kind of branch out and you can say, well, I'm tired of using that combination mitochondrial product. I'm gonna give the person you know, specific doses of PQQ and CoQ10 and magnesium and thiamine, because now I know more, and so I'm going to just track this much more carefully. In other words, you can get great results in the very beginning if you adopt a simplistic attitude towards doing this. It's better for patients anyways, because who wants to take 1,600 different supplements, you know? So the way they got the Omex test broken out is on the beginning of the lab, they have a couple of large categories or baskets they've kind of lumped things into. This is really helpful. Think of it as like an orientation packet towards what you're about to look at. So you can see, okay, what are the general things that I'm thinking about here? And they rate them, you know, green is always good and then red is always bad. And then you can also see on the front pages of the test, this other summary by section, which I find incredibly helpful. Again, green is good, red is bad. So you can just get your mind around like, uh, you're looking at this, you'll see, oh, okay, well, there's a couple of amino acids, and what kind of stands out here? Immediately, it stands out that there's some serious B vitamin problems and that the neurotransmitters are screwed up. So right away, you have an, a way to start to think about the lab. And at the biggest picture level, and this would make any real scientist cringe, but this is how I think about it clinically, there's really four major subjects that I have to know about based on this test. I know there's probably like 1,675, but there's four that really matter in my mind. Okay, and I'm gonna write them down here. You can write them down too. What's happening with the mitochondria? Good, bad, what do, you, do you need to do something? What's happening with the brain? Do you need to work with neurotransmission? Do you need to work with brain chemicals? What's happening with the liver detox pathways? L big problem, little problem. And then what's happening with uh, the GI-related markers? Okay, so mitochondria, brain, liver, and GI. That's the super high level way of looking at this. And you should be able to fold most of the markers into one of those areas, give or take a little bit, okay? Mitochondria, brain, liver, and GI. That's a high level breakdown. If you treat the mitochondria, the brain, the liver, and the GI tract based on the markers here, that's four things that you can do, one or two supplements for each category. That's a getting started version of the test. And then you can learn about the many roles of lysine. And if you see lysine transporter problems in someone's gut or whatever, you can get all to, into the complexity later. But if you can successfully treat the mitochondria, the brain, the liver detox pathways, and the GI tract, you're gonna be in pretty good shape. So here's what we're, this is a slide about what we're not talking about, which is kind of silly uh, to have a slide that 
we're ignoring. But the point is that you don't have to know all this stuff. You know, I've spent the last seven years obsessively learning about the differences between like fumarate and succinate. And I could probably name almost all the enzymes on this path series of pathways here. You know, not all of them, but I could probably name half of these or more and actually understand what they look like and how they work. Okay. But the point of this slide is that you absolutely don't need to know any of that. You just need to know that there's a mitochondria problem and you've got one or two supplements that are really good for the mitochondria. And that's enough to get patient results and get people better. Where are you going to start? Well, B vitamins. And so when my teacher asked me about, uh, about five, six years ago, what's the single most important nutrient in the human body? And I was kind of stuttering and I didn't know what to say. And I was like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I probably said magnesium or something like that. And it clearly wasn't what he was after. And then he said, okay, look, he felt sorry for me. He's like, forget about that question. What's the single most important nutrient for all life? <laughs> so he took it from humans to like all life on the planet, except for like some bacteria or something. And I was like even more confused. The answer was B vitamins. And then I thought, well, how important really are the B vitamins? And then I thought, well, you know, who really assesses the level of importance of stuff? Well, the Nobel Prize Committee gives out the Nobel Prize in medicine every year. And that's kind of a nice way to track how important things are scientifically in terms of discovery, breakthrough, the effect on clinical medicine and everything like that. So I did a little journey down the history of this. And in 1929, this guy got a Nobel Prize for B1. Okay. And the B vitamin Nobel Prizes kept coming. Okay. They threw in one on vitamin D, one on vitamin C there, all the way through to 1964. That means the worldwide scientific community between 1929 and 1964, many, many times, decided that a vitamin was the most important thing that had happened that year in terms of clinical application and medicine and scientific breakthroughs. And the majority of them were B vitamins, okay? So this is a reality. Now, in the current era, we don't think a lot about B vitamins, you know, because they're not that new. They've been around. We discovered them 100 years ago. But when we get into the lab results in a minute, I want to say that the first thing you got to look at and really understand if you really want to change metabolism is the B vitamins. There are many of these markers that you will see that are related to the fact that we have different genetic needs for B vitamins. And there's books about this. Here's an example of one if you want to get it. This is a really good book. It's kind of complicated, but it's good. Inherited metabolic diseases in adults. And what, we're, what they're saying basically is that person to person, B vitamin needs vary dramatically. And some of what you're going to see on this test is going to be related to genomics, the genome, the genes of that person. And some of what you're seeing on the test is going to be related to the diet and what they've been exposed to throughout their life. It's a mix of those two things. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of these slides because they're kind of a little basic. So the second thing to take in once we look at the B vitamin markers in terms of levels of importance would be amino acids. Amino acids are really important for individual reasons and they're really important because of their roles in protein synthesis. So when your body is making proteins, you need 20 amino acids. If you're going to make an insulin molecule, if you're going to make hemoglobin, if you're going to make antibodies, maybe you're fighting a viral infection. If you're going to make just about anything in the body, right, that there's not too much in your body that's not a protein, but if you're going to make any protein in the body, you need all 20 amino acids present. Every enzyme, every everything requires all 20 amino acids. So amino acids take on a really important role. Amino acids also have what are called non-protein functions. They do things besides helping you make proteins. And so an amino acid deficiency of like glycine could impact your gallbladder's ability to make bile because you need glycine to make bile along with taurine. You need those two amino acids. But glycine is also one of the 20 amino acids that you may need to make all proteins in the body. So that's a, a background factoid on uh, amino acids. And then you can look at the relationship between B vitamins and the enzymes. So the enzymes are made up of proteins. They're amino acids, right? 
we take amino acids, string them together, we make proteins, and this is what we call an enzyme. And then the B vitamins are what make the enzyme work for carb metabolism, for the citric acid cycle, for methylation, for neurotransmission, for hormone production, for all these different reasons, you need enzymes and you need B vitamins working together. And remember, the enzymes require amino acids to be made, and then the B vitamins, you have to have B vitamins. And here's how it works. You know, you have an enzyme, the B vitamin comes in, it makes it do something. Um, and then the variety of patient complaints that are related to B vitamins and amino acids, I don't know, in my practice, it's probably at least half of what I treat are problems that are indirectly or directly related to B vitamin or amino acid issues. Detoxification, well, we're going to go through this in a minute, but the, the list is pretty long. I'm going to just show you. So you need B vitamins to correct the neuroendocrine system, the GI tract, to detox properly. You need sulfur amino acids to detox. You need glutamine, which is an amino acid, to heal the leaky gut. When you're in an adrenal exhausted state, you're breaking through, breaking down, smushing around your amino acids. That's called a catabolic state. You're using amino acids for fuel when you're stressed. So amino acids get depleted when we're in trouble, and we need to replete or put them back in to get the neuroendocrine and GI and detox systems working. And similar story with B vitamins. You need B vitamins for each one of these different levels of correction. So when I like to think about you know, this from the patient perspective and then from our perspective. So the patients are worried about gaining weight or being tired or being depressed or being anxious. Maybe they have GI problems or no sex drive, something like that is bugging them. And then we're way over here saying we're these functional medicine specialty folks and we're interested in the underlying cause. Is there a spiritual breakdown of that person? Are they spiritually disconnected? Are they eating too much gluten? Do they have a GI tract infection? Are they toxic? Is there a genetic problem, right? So we're operating way over here and patients are operating way over here. And somehow as we're going through these labs, and when you get good at this, it's really fun. You want to explain to the patient who's depressed how this omics test relates to depression. So when you look at the omics test and when you're looking at, and you're talking to a depressed patient, you look at all the markers that relate to depression. If you're working with a patient who uh, has insomnia, then you look at all the omics markers first that are directly related to insomnia. And if you can do that, then the test will come alive for the patient. The patient will go, oh my gosh, I didn't know all these things were going on that were related to my sleep problem. You can see all that on the test. You're like, yeah, I can. So when I look at a lab and I talk to the patient about the lab, I'm thinking about their top one or two complaints and how this test is going to solve their problems. So every lab consultation is different depending on what the patient's symptoms are. And that works really well, okay? So, B vitamins and metabolism. Let's say the person's overweight and they can't burn body fat. This would be like, you know, the discussion. You talk about the metabolic markers and B vitamins in relation to being able to burn fat and burn carbs. What if the patient has a methylation defect? Then you can talk about the B vitamin and amino acid markers in relation to methylation. And you guys probably know all this already, but let me just cover this just because it's a quick reminder. So, of course, you need uh, B6, B12, and folate to methylate. But then the single carbon pool, the single carbon pool, and I like how they made this blue in the diagram. It's like a swimming pool or something. The single carbon pool, which is what methylation is all about, right? Methylation is slinging carbons around. But the, the carbons have to come from somewhere or you can't methylate anything. And where do the carbons come from? They come from amino acids. Which ones? Serine, glycine, histidine, tryptophan, glut glutamine, right? There's like five of them, I think, four or five of them. So you need amino acids to grab the carbons from in order to use the B vitamins to methylate. So again, shows up over and over again. Patient has a problem with methylation, you can talk about amino acids and B vitamins. Patient has a problem with their nervous system, they're depressed, they're anxious, they're in pain. You can talk about the role of B vitamins and amino acids in um, a neurological function. Patient is stressed, they have an adrenal problem, they're breaking down tissue, they can't put on muscle mass. You can talk about the amino acids and B vitamins in relation to uh, catabolic physiology.
Same with carbohydrate metabolism. They're craving sweets every day. They're gaining weight. They have all kinds of body fat. They have high cholesterol, high triglycerides, high whatever. You can talk about insulin and its role in regulating carbohydrate metabolism and how this test measures pyruvate and lactate. I'll make an L for lactate and, or lactic acid and pyruvic acid. And we'll let them know how much of a problem is going, you know, how much of their problem is coming from insulin resistance or a pre-diabetic state that's related to, again, I hate to be a broken record here, B vitamins and amino acids. Toxins, it's the same. Just goes on and on, right? Because we need B vitamins, very famously, to run both phase one and phase two, and you need amino acids. To, I mean, that's kind of what phase two is all about, is amino acids. Which ones? Methionine, cysteine, uh, glycine, taurine, glutamine, glutathione. But what's glutathione made of? Free amino acids, cysteine, glutamine, and glycine. So it just keeps coming back around over and over again. That's why these programs can be so successful, even if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Because if you see a marker that indicates a person needs B vitamins or amino acids or something else you know, on these labs, you're going to be hitting all these different mechanisms, maybe not even on purpose. Oh, that's complicated. We skip that. I want to look at the labs. Okay, here's a lab. Here's an example of labs. Okay, so this is a, a sample taken from a, an omics test, and now we're just saying how important the B vitamins are for all these different processes. So if you have a patient who's toxic, you're going to explain to them how this B vitamin section is important because B vitamins help you detoxify. If you have a, a woman who's got hormone imbalances. You're going to talk about how this B vitamin section is so important for her because B vitamins regulate hormone production and hormone breakdown. If the patient has fatigue, then you're going to talk about how B vitamins are so important for mitochondrial energy production. If the person has depression, you're going to talk about how the B vitamins are so important for neurotransmitter production. See what I mean? I call that the condition description technique, is that you've got the condition that they have. They're depressed, they're fat, they're tired. Their, um, their sex drive is low, whatever it is, and you're explaining why B vitamins and amino acids and these other organic acids markers matter for them. So that brings the test alive. If you just generically explain what pyruvic acid does, then it's just, you know, people just fall asleep, literally, you know, um, unless they have insomnia. In this case, they'll probably just get pissed off and start yelling at you. They won't fall asleep. But, you know, if you see a high pyruvic acid, you can then explain, okay, this means you need B vitamins. Let me tell you about how B vitamins will help your hormones or your depression or your whatever it might be. That's the skill set that you can learn. And if you learn that skill set, then you'll have it made. If you see any marker that says B vitamins high, I want to show you, this is like how easy this can be. Any of these B vitamin markers high, you can get into the weeds on exactly what that means, or you can simply give them a high potency B complex. And if you give one a day and it doesn't work after a few weeks, give them two a day. Okay, just increase it. You don't have to get down into understanding the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme and all the dimers that are involved in that and how that relates to everything. You really don't need to understand that in order to get people better. I think you should understand that and study that as the years roll by, but in terms of getting started, you don't need to know it, okay? Absolutely not. And if we all waited until we understood this test to order this test, then no one would ever order this test. And we don't wanna do that. So this page is super important. So if someone comes up to you next week and you're just walking down the street and you're trying to go get a piece of pizza or something, and the person comes up to you and said, okay, what's the, you are a doctor of natural medicine. What's the most important nutrient for all life on earth? You're going to go, wait a minute. Kayla said B vitamins, B vitamins. So the next time you get this test back, look at this section and prescribe B vitamins. And then you'll see all these amazing things happen to people. So now I, I tried to start with something that's obvious that you're going to see all the time. And then I wanted to do cover beta oxidation because this one gets missed a lot. Um, in fact, I missed... I missed the importance of beta oxidation for like 22 years. So I'm seven years into understanding the importance of beta oxidation. And 
that's a little embarrassing. I don't want you to be in that position, okay? You should, if you can understand this in the next year or two, you'll be way ahead of most practitioners out there. So we have to make energy in order for our mitochondria or in order for the cells to work, right? And so we can do that from fat and from carbs and from protein. You don't want to generally burn a ton of amino acids for fuel. You want to do other things with amino acids. Those are the more important things to happen with them. But you want to use primarily fat and a little bit of carbohydrate for your energy source. The ability to burn fat, that process, if this goes back to like high school chemistry or biology or maybe you know your graduate program physiology class, the process of burning fat is called beta oxidation. Beta oxidation. And when we're at rest, just standing around like I am right now or sitting around listening to a webinar, unless you're running somewhere while you're listening to this or biking somewhere, if you're just at rest and listening, 80 to 90% of your cellular energy is coming from the process of beta oxidation. When you start to exercise, that changes around. But most of the time, most of your energy, if you haven't, this is assuming you haven't eaten recently, right? If you just ate, then everything's different. Or if you're exercising, things are different. But if you haven't eaten for a while and, you have, and you're not exercising, then most of the energy that you're burning is coming from this process. So it's a very important process. And if you don't have good beta oxidation, it's very difficult for you to be happy at rest. Now, you have to just kind of bear with me on this diagram because it, you know, there's a punchline to this. We can hang in there. Okay, so let me just kind of set the stage here. This is the cytosol. That's the blue part. That's the gunk that's floating around in your cell. The green is all mitochondria. This is the intermembrane space. This is the mitochondrial matrix. And here's the outer membrane of the mitochondria and the inner membrane. Okay, and the inner and outer membrane are these phospholipids that are back to back. Right? So these are fats, or fatty acids. I think they're like 16 carbons long each, so the whole thing's like 32 carbons long. And now, in order to burn energy, and again, this is the main fuel source. If you if fuel source, if you haven't eaten recently, or if you um, are not exercising, the main this is the main process by which you make energy. So your body has to take the fatty acid which is outside the mitochondria. The main one is called palmitate or palmitic acid. It has to take that fatty acid and it uh, breaks it down and turns it into palmitoyl CoA. But look at this, palmitoyl CoA, it's a really big molecule and it's so big that it can't get across this membrane. Now, if the fatty acids could just diffuse across these cell membranes, can you imagine how chaotic life would be? It means that if I had ice cream tonight and all of a sudden all the fat could just get through all these membranes, you know, you'd probably just keel over. Your mitochondria would just get all gunked up and you just like die every time you had a bite of ice cream. So your body highly regulates how much fat can get in here, highly, highly regulates it. And the molecule that we're talking about is so big that it can't transport itself across this membrane, cannot do it, can't get in. But that's on purpose, it's not a bad thing. Your body's keeping it out on purpose. So in order to make this whole thing work, your body takes that palmitic acid molecule and it strips off the CoA and it crams on a carnitine. And see how much smaller that is? And then the carnitine just waltzes right through this enzyme, carnitine acetyltransferase one, and it slips right through this, like a little chute here, the translocase protein. And then poof, here you go. Now you got your palmitic acid, your palmitate, you're inside the mitochondrial matrix. The carnitine goes, hey, that was fun, job well done. The carnitine goes back out to do this again. And then you take that uh, palmitic acid, you cram a CoA on it again. By the way, that's B5, right? That's a B vitamin, co coenzyme A, it's B vitamin. You cram a CoA on there and then you burn it up for energy. So this is a complicated process. It took me like, two and a half minutes just to explain it. There's a lot of different steps and any one of these steps can get screwed up. And they do, which means that in those people, they don't burn fat for energy really well. So what happens? Your mitochondria don't do well. That makes you depressed, you gain weight, you're tired all the time, you can't sleep, your brain hurts, all kinds of problems happen if your mitochondria aren't working well. So this is the size problem. This is the whole issue here. It's a physical barrier size. You have to have that carnitine. And there's no backup shuttle here. 
you know, I was thinking about this, like, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but like, if you're, and this happened to me like two weeks ago, you, you have to go to the airport, but like, it's a really early morning flight. And then there's no other flights, like, you know, for hours and hours after that. So you have to get on that plane. And you know how like you don't sleep that well and you wake up a little early and I ended up at the airport like five hours early because I just couldn't sleep because I was worried if I didn't get that plane then it, you know the whole thing was going to get screwed up. And so that's like this. If you don't have carnitine, there's no alternative shuttle here. There's not like 16 planes waiting to take you if you mix, miss the first plane. It's either carnitine or nothing. Okay, so if you don't have a carnitine molecule, this whole process is going to fall apart. There's no backup mechanism for the transport of these fats. If you don't like that, call the design team, yell at somebody. Okay, now there are other ways that other fats can get in. What we're talking about are the long chain fatty acids. The short and medium chains can just slip right through the membrane, they're smaller. Okay, that's why some people get kind of crazy, crazy happy about medium chain fatty acids and whatnot. But you, you have to learn how to, your body has to be able to burn the long chains or none of this is gonna work. And guess what, there's a test. <laughs> Like, you can't even believe how cool this is, that you can test this stuff, you guys. If you don't understand how to test beta oxidation, you just haven't had much fun yet. So look, here it is, adipic acid, superic acid, okay? These are the markers that tell you whether fatty acids can be transported across the membrane or not. And look, there it says right there, carnitine, okay? So if these markers are high, you don't have enough carnitine to burn these fats. It's your mitochondrial crisis. And what's the solution? You give carnitine. Malonic acid is the same if that marker is high. There's nothing else that can substitute. You give carnitine. And the whole thing starts to work properly. Now, do you want to give carnitine to everybody? No, you just want to give carnitine to people who show that they have a problem based on the test. That's the whole point of doing the testing. I'm gonna just take a, a breath for a moment because that was just a lot to take in. I don't know about for you, but for me it was. Okay, let's shift gears here. I'm trying to cram in maybe a little bit too much into this class, I apologize, but um, there's just B vitamins, carnitine, okay? We're gonna hit neurotransmitters. This is gonna get a little deep. There's a variety of reasons why neurotransmitters can get messed up. I mean, the obvious thing is that you're just deficient in them because you're stressed out of your mind because there's a worldwide pandemic and you haven't seen your friends in a long time. Maybe you're not eating that well. Maybe you have H. pylori and you need to do a gut test. You know, you're not absorbing uh, amino acids and proteins very well, right? Because you have a gut problem. Maybe you're on an antidepressant because you're depressed and that's depleted you even more. So many, many of our patients have neurotransmitter deficiency. You can also have damaged neurons. That means you hit your head against a windshield because your car was going 75 miles an hour and then you hit a truck and then you got in a car accident and then that's a problem. Or maybe you're uh, an athlete and you're a football player. You hit your head every day at work you know, you fell off a horse or whatever it may be. You can also have physical damage to neurons from neurotoxins. I mean, probably the classic one would be lead or maybe mercury. Those are heavy metals that get into the brain and damage the neurons. So you can have a defic deficiency state, you can have a damaged state, and there are many, many of our patients that have genetic reasons why they don't make brain chemicals properly. So if the neuron is damaged, and it doesn't really matter whether it got damaged because you hit your head in a car accident or because you have a bunch of mercury uh, that's hit your brain. It could be, I mean, it's like the difference between, we were watching these Agatha Christie movies the other night with the kids. It's like a difference between, I don't know if you saw the murder on the Orient Express one, but uh, the guy gets, well, I don't want to ruin it. Well, I'm going to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it. He gets stabbed 12 times, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing the movie for you. But, you know, does it matter if the guy got stabbed 12 times or if he got shot? Not really. It's the Agatha Christie movie. He's dead either way. So neurons, it doesn't really matter if the neurons are damaged because you hit your head, because you got a bunch of mercury in there, or because you're stressed out of your mind. It doesn't really matter what's damaging the neurons. Once they're damaged, they're damaged. And when you see the labs, you want to try to figure out what's causing the damage, but, you know, um, you really want to fix the neurotransmission first. So you can measure all these things on here, okay? And you have these fancy markers, and I'm gonna show you um, 
the main one that I thought I would focus on for today is, uh, well, the main ones would be dopamine related issues and then serotonin related issues. I want to kind of stick with dopamine because we can't do everything. We don't have that much time. And this one is super important. So there's a couple different ways that you can correct low dopamine, low epinephrine, and low norepinephrine. And I'll show you the lab markers in a second. Tyrosine works really well. If that's not strong enough, then you can use an herbal product called Makuna. And Makuna is a herbal form of L-DOPA. And I don't know, if you really, I don't know. If, you, if, if we were at IFM and we were out and then we went to a really cool bar and I had had like two rye Manhattans and you asked me, really, Dan, what's your favorite supplement? And I was a little tipsy. I would probably say Makuna, you know? Normally I'd probably say, oh, I couldn't really pick my favorite, there's so many, but Makuna works so incredibly well for people that are low in these particular brain chemicals. It probably leads to, in my patient practice, when you're looking at like what a single pill can do in terms of totally changing someone's life, the Makuna related products are probably the number one choice I would pick. Um, it's not always a problem with everybody, but when you have a person with this problem and you give the right amount of Makuna, it's pretty life-changing for people. And it's not a it's not a supplement that you hear a ton about, you know, but it's probably my favorite one. Um, there's no regulation to the amount of dopamine synthesized from Makuna, so you have to be a little careful with it. You can give people too much of it. With tyrosine, there's highly regulated steps. There are these enzymes, okay, that really really, really make a difference. So let me show you here. If you give someone tyrosine, it will convert to dopamine and norepinephrine for sure. But there's a rate limiting step here. There's an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase. And once your epinephrine and norepinephrine go up to a certain point, this signal shuts this conversion down. So tyrosine can only bring up dopamine to a certain point, And eventually this enzyme gets shut down and then what does your body do with the tyrosine? It, there's plenty of other things you can do with it. You can go make thyroid hormones, you can go make proteins, you can do all kinds of things. So there's an inherent sort of shutoff valve for tyrosine. So it's hard to over prescribe tyrosine because of this. Your body will just do something else with it. However, Makuna is past that or the L-DOPA is past that enzyme in terms of the pathways. So Makuna just goes straight over. The more Makuna you give, the more dopamine they make. That is a really good thing, and it's a really dangerous thing. So you just have to be aware not to give people too much Makuna. So very, very often when you see dopamine, epinephrine, or norepinephrine markers low, you're gonna see glutathione markers equally low. There's a very strong relationship between low glutathione and damage to the neurons in the brain. There are also nutrients that are used to make glutathione that are also used to make dopamine, the main one being cysteine. Okay, so there's a combination of problems that can happen. If you're exposed to an environmental toxin, mercury, lead, benzene, toluene, diesel exhaust, lipstick with lead in it, it could be a house cleaning agent, whatever you're exposed to, and that lowers your glutathione, that can also have a negative impact on your brain because a lot of these toxins are neurotoxins and will damage the dopamine-related neurons. So imagine you have a toxin, it lowers your glutathione, and it gets into your brain and it damages your neuron that's related to dopamine. Now you're like doubly screwed because a neuron is gone, Damage means dead, right? Neurons dead, gone, not working anymore. That brain cell is just like checked out. Your glutathione's low, so you can't protect your brain very well either. And you people end up in these cascades of badness where there's more and more neurons getting killed. There's more and more low levels of glutathione until they eventually end up getting depressed or anxious or something happens. Okay. Now, and another fact, and this is like so important, it's kind of mind numbing. I'm just going to mention it briefly, but you should study this later, or we can do a seminar on it sometime if you want, is that your body has a choice moment to moment whether it's going to make glutathione or whether it's going to use those same raw ingredients to run methylation. And you can't do both full on at the same time. Every time you make glutathione, your body has to decide if it's gonna 
pull nutrients from the methylation process to make that glutathione. And every time your body's trying to choose between making glutathione and dealing with methylation, glutathione will win out. So your body preferentially will make glutathione at the sacrifice of methylating. And in fact, we had a case like this on Tuesday in class. This was really cool. This was so cool because you can see it on the lab. The patient had a homocysteine level of like 130 or something like that. And the doctor said, I've got it down to a 14, which is pretty damn impressive. And so the doctor had been working on methylation for this patient for a while. But then we looked at the glutathione levels and guess what? They were low. So there's no way that you can fix methylation with low glutathione. You can't fix it completely. Why? Because you're always going to be diverting all the things you use for methylation to making glutathione if your glutathione levels are low. And your body preferentially chooses to make glutathione because it's basically it's more important than methylating. You think methylation is important. Well, glutathione is a lot more important. And I'm, that's not a personal opinion. That's the design team of the human body's opinion. Your body will preferentially make glutathione over methylation every single time, okay? So this ends up taking on importance. And if you have methylation issues with patients, you just gotta think this one through because it's a common scenario. So now you can measure all this stuff. All right, I know this takes a long time to learn, but it's really, really worth it. So in this case, we're looking at neurotransmission and you can measure obviously tryptophan, which is the amino acid you need to make uh, serotonin. You can also measure the inflammatory markers that are related, like kynurinic, uh, here it is, kynurinic acid, quino, quinolinic acid. You can measure xanther, xantherinic acid, which is a B6 marker, and get a really complete picture of if the brain is inflamed, if there's an individual amino acid, is, uh, amino acid that's interfering with neurotransmitter production. Okay, and they're the similar kinds of markers related to dopamine. Toxins and toxin-induced neuro, neuro damage. I kind of mentioned this already. Yeah, heavy metal or chemical issues damages brain cells, causes problems with the detox pathways. Now there's another example of this too. And I've been using this slide for like 15 years, but now <laughs> it's like so relevant. Who would have ever thought? I never thought, anyways. There was a pandemic in uh, 1918, and there were a large number of people, and this is an interesting story, right, because around four years after the acute phase of the pandemic ended, in 1922, they started to see incredibly high levels of different neurological conditions four years after the pandemic started. And they made a movie out of this whole story, and many of you might have seen it. It's a great film if you haven't seen it. Um, Robin Williams, who passed away recently, which is sad, and Robert De Niro. Robin Williams is one of my favorite people. He's such a cool guy. Anyways, uh, they made a movie, and uh, Robin Williams played Oliver Sacks, if you can believe that. He played this neurologist. And it's a true story. And um, about a real person, there's the real Oliver Sacks there. But what they did was they found that these people that had this uh, encephalitis, this fever encephalitis, all of a sudden could regain their function by taking L-DOPA. Now, it didn't work for very long. That's kind of a complicated story I won't get into. But it did work for a little while. And it showed people that the damage to the brain that occurred from this, this pandemic back in 1918 could be treated by doing the exact same stuff that we've been talking about in all these recent slides. Looking at the dopamine levels, replacing what's missing with L-DOPA or Macuna and tyrosine, looking at the glutathione levels and getting the sulfur amino acids to work properly. In fact, if they had had an omics test in 1922, they probably would have helped a lot of these people from the 1918 pandemic. Okay, and so there's a history here, and this is not the first time that these things have happened. And so I think it's worth going back and looking at, you know, what happened before. And just the simple fact that it was four years into the pandemic that things got really bad. We're only two, year, two years into it, folks. So we're not even beginning to see, you know, the full extent of what's going to happen with the patient population in the United States. Okay, so order these tests. 
do 10 or 20 of them, run 10 or 20 of them, and set up 10 or 20 treatment programs before you develop a strong opinion about it, you can't tell from five or six tests how much, you know, how well these things are going to work. You need a volume of at least 20 people to really see how profound this work is, okay? And then we'll come back later and talk more about the GI map, because as I've inferred many times in this talk, the GI tract is an essential part of fixing all this. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a moment and, and see if there are any questions for the last few minutes. Thank you, Dr. Kalish. Uh, yes, we, we got a number of excellent questions, um, so let's try to get a couple of them squared away. Our first one is, how is the OMEX test different from the previous existing organic acid tests available from other labs? So it's the latest version with the latest science organized in a way that the research community looks at these things. Okay, it's also got more markers and it's got an up-to-date version of all the markers so it's almost like an older organic acids test that's been brought up to date. All right, um, next question that we have is, what do you do for patients in terms of retesting? So I retest every six months, and it's very complicated to interpret the retests. But if you study the pathways and you look at what you were prescribing to the patient, it'll start to make sense. But that takes a little bit of training to really see, because like I'll give a simple example that we see all the time. Let's say that the initial test, the patient has chronic fatigue and they're not physically active at all. This just happened yesterday in my practice to a patient, this woman, Helen. So Helen is you know, chronic fatigue, physically inactive, not doing any exercise or anything. And so six months goes by, we test her, a year goes by, we do another test, and now we're at the one year mark and her lab comes back this just happened on like yesterday or the day before. And the lab comes back and she's freaking out because now there's all these super high markers that weren't there before. And then the amino acids are really low, especially the branched chain aminos. And then she's freaking out because it looks on the, side, on the surface that the lab is getting worse. And then I'm like, okay, Helen, well, let me tell you what's happening in terms of your physical activity. She's like, well, I'm exercising every day. I didn't used to be able to walk up the stairs, but now I'm riding my bike every day for an hour, hour and a half. And I walk for three or four miles and I'm, she was doing weights. She's like in college, she's old, right? She's like in her seventies. She's like in college, I used to study bodybuilding. So now she's like lifting weights and she used to not walk up the stairs and lie in bed all the day. So I explained, okay, well now you're using your muscles again. You're burning through amino acids. So some of those levels dropped, especially the ones that are used to make muscle. And your mitochondria were just kind of getting a little lazy. They weren't very active because you weren't very active. Now that you're exercising like a crazy woman, you've got huge amounts of oxidative stress from the physical activity and your mitochondrial markers shut up because you're using them. This is a good thing. Now we're gonna hone in on the markers that we see on the current test, but this is progress, right? This is your mitochondria being used and your muscles being used. So her oxidative stress markers went up because she's exercising more and her mitochondrial markers shut up and her branched chain amino acids dropped, which again, could look like the person's worse, but in Helen's case, it was a sign that she was becoming physically active again, like she had been in her younger years. Thank you. Um, our next question is, I've only used these types of tests for my most difficult patients. Can they be used outside of chronic illness? So, you know, I was taught that you do lifestyle and a gut test and maybe, I don't know, thyroid workup or adrenals on everybody. And then if a year goes by and they're really not getting better, then you pull out the, the big guns and you do organic acids. And that's sort of been, a, at least for my generation of practitioners, it's just how, how we looked at these tests as only for diagnostic evaluation of chronically ill people. I have completely reversed my position on that now because why wait until someone's really sick? Why not find you know these problems even in childhood, you know? And you can see enzyme defects in 10, 15 year old kids. You can see insulin resistance before the person is gonna show that they're pre-diabetic. So why not just fix all these things in the earlier phases? So I think of an organic acids or omics test as a wellness checkup for everybody. And I think it's actually better utilized in that context than it is to wait until someone's got these complex chronic illnesses and then try to reverse them out of it. 
All right, and I think we're getting close. To, so this will be our final question. Um, so how do you determine where to start when there are a large number of markers that are out of range? Well, I should just tell you what I actually do probably. Okay, so let's let's break it down. Remember in the beginning, I just grossly, grossly simplified this into uh, four areas that you should think about. Mitochondria, brain, liver, and GI. I would always start with brain. And once you've done, if they have a problem with the neurotransmitter related markers, I would start there, get them feeling better. And as soon as they're a month or two into the program, if they have GI markers, then deal with that. If the brain markers are okay and you don't see much there, then I would always start with mitochondria. Because again, those programs are gonna get people feeling better, getting their body working better, and then you can attack the liver and GI issues later. If you start with detox really aggressively in someone who's quite sick, they might get worse. So brain and then mitochondria would be your beginning places, and then liver detox and GI would happen in like phase two. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kalish. So we are just out of time now. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We look forward to having you back in for the next episode of our Metabolomics Masterclass series. For more information about test offerings from Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory, please visit diagnosticsolutionslab.com. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day, everyone.